So right now we're turning our attention to democracy itself and elections, especially in the West African sub-region. I don't know how many of you have heard of Econec. Yes, it's, um, it's affiliated with ECOWAS. It's actually the ECOWAS network of electoral commissions. Um, it's like a coming together of all electoral bodies in the ECOWAS sub-region to see how it is that they can better the conduct of elections and also make uh, the cost of conducting our elections a little more reasonable. But, I mean, I get ahead of myself. I have somebody here <laughs> who can help shed a little more light uh, on this body and what exactly it seeks to do. I have with me in the studio Dr. Zanita Ajaman Rawlins, who is an honourable member of Parliament at the Kotli Kotli of the Kotli Kotli constituency um, in Ghana. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily. Thank you very much. And welcome to Nigeria. Thank you. I hope My you've not been having any rows over our jollof rice or whether it's going. Yeah, we, we had a moment <laughs> last night because there was jollof rice on the menu. Oh, I there still was. I still think jollof rice. <laughs> moment, so. Don't let us get started on that. But let's talk about um, elections. Let's talk about democracy. Yes. I think that increasingly people are, are asking about the cost of democracy. They're asking about, well, maybe not the cost, but how much it actually costs us. Because when we look at how much it takes to conduct elections, the fact that you know, leaders are only in office for four years and then we have to do this all over again, um, co co compared with what countries earn, it, it does look like it's quite a significant financial burden. Um, how is Econec helping to address this? I think that's exactly the reason why it's what it is, as in a network of electoral commissions, because... Um, there is a standard, there is a gold standard with regards to what it takes to have the tick boxes that say uh, free, fair, inclusive elections in any, in any state, for example. And um, as part of this is the establishment of a, um, a depot in, in Sierra Leone, in Lungi, to actually have some of the equipment and the, 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 the materials required for elections within the sub-region so that um, one can kind of dip into the pool for use in elections so that one isn't always having to start from scratch. But yes, it tends to be a costly affair across board. We just feel it a lot more on the continent because we don't, we're still getting there in terms of our development to start with. And I think when people don't see the direct link between voting and development as quickly as they expect to within that cycle, it, ra it raises more and more questions about the cost involved in elections. But elections are a costly endeavor no matter where you are. Yeah, I'm reading this uh, report from, well, it's not a report now, the address of um, our own um, IMEC chairman here, uh, Mr. Mahmoud Yakubu, whom we understand has also been very uh, you know, instrumental to contributing significantly to that depot you spoke of in Sierra Leone. But he said something about um, undertaking a major study and the worrisome cost of conducting elections in the sub-region, focusing on two countries from each of the three linguistic blocs, this Anglophone, uh, Nigeria and Liberia, Francophone, Benin Republic and Senegal, yes. and Lusophone, Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau. Yes. Now, we don't know what the report said, but... I don't know if you've seen it or you've heard. From I, we, we, we were all given copies of the report, but okay. it's, a huge, it's a huge document and yeah. you want to really go through it properly before making a full comment. But in general, I think it is what it is. The cost of elections is high and is only going to get higher unless we have a way of stemming the tide. And I think one of the most obvious things is the monetization of our politics. It's mm. just getting worse and worse. And um, the, the theme of this symposium um, is actually the inclusivity and with regards to women, youth, and persons with disability, as well as other marginalized persons, including internally displaced persons, um, which people don't tend to think about. You know, one thinks of refugees moving from one country to the next, but even within the same country, when you have spots of conflict, people move from where they normally would reside and vote, and therefore can become disenfranchised within their own state. And um, the, the, the whole import of this is the fact that elections are important as part of the democratic process and consolidation of democracy. And the, 
one of the one of the jokes that was made is one is hoping that Econec will be heard more of than Ecomog or any of the other you know armed forces that uh, one has to put together in terms of conflict resolution and peace building because if we can ensure that the transfer of power is peaceful if we can ensure that the electoral process is as peaceful as possible then the need for actually deploying forces within the sub-region actually is um, decreased yeah so I know that the conference, uh, the, the, this um, coming together now, I'm looking for the right word for it, and an assembly, yes. the, the General Assembly of Econec right now, uh, is focused largely on inclusivity. You talk, talked about women and children, forget about them, women and young people, and also those with disabilities as well. Um, what have you found so far? I think by and large, the issue of uh, financing mm -hmm. of campaigns is one of the biggest things that keeps most people especially women and young people and persons with disability out of politics. The other thing as well are the various things with persons with disability, some things we take for granted like access to the uh, polling stations, um, access to areas in the constituency, for example, access to material, you know, access to, to visual aids when you're voting so that you can have the sanctity of your vote and still be able to make a choice. Um, for example, because uh, um, in albinism, for example, they have um, visual, um, visual defects which require them to use visual aids. If you don't have visual aids in a polling booth, you, you pretty much put someone at a disadvantage where they either have to guess who they're voting for or they need assistance, which takes away the sanctity of their vote and the, the secrecy of their vote as well. And um, with the youth, the uh, unfortunate trend we've noticed is um, they tend to be um, taken on board by political groups who are hoping to either incite, incite some kind of uh, violence sometimes or who want to use them in uh, mobilizing certain groups but um, don't really empower them in terms of putting them in a position to take those places in ter uh, on the ballot paper or be an active part of the electoral process and this was supposed to help us address some of the reasons why we don't have enough youth doing so, taking part in the, uh, the electoral process and how we can engage them. And um, one of the biggest things we're looking at is the demographic dividend, obviously, in the sub-region and the fact that a huge number of our youth are unemployed. You know, are we, not, are we being creative enough with respect to how to get our youth engaged so that they're not there for other people to take advantage of or use as pawns in a game that may be even bigger than they realize? You know, so this is one of the things that we really looked at very closely. And the marginalization of the youth out of mainstream politics is a huge thing. And um, one of the jokes that was made yesterday was the fact that a lot of the older generation don't want to make space for the youth in politics. So they don't want to move out so the youth aren't able to find their way into mainstream politics but we had a lot of good stories as well I mean in Ghana for example the uh, average age of a member of parliament is 48.2 years old and um, we have a parliament of 275 we only have 38 women which is 13.8 percent no special seats in Ghana so women youth persons with disability everyone has to fight on the same playing ground which is not quite fair given the dynamics and it's not just in Ghana it's across the sub-region as well so the difficulties with stigma the difficulties with cultural orientation with our societal upbringing with regards to what women are meant to do what women are allowed to do what they're permitted to do what youth are permitted to do because you tend to have a society that does not make room for the younger generation because you know we have the elders and they kind of take the front line and the youth are supposed to wait their turn but the fact is we have a huge portion of our population who are young these are the ones who if we will tap into their youthful exuberance if we'll tap into their potential we could actually see Africa take huge leaps ahead rather than see it as a threat and allow others who are looking to use them in um, all kinds of terrorists and um, other kind of activities make use of the youth when we could actually use them for nation building. Mm. I find it, well, it's a good thing that you're a woman, you're here, you're talking about the problems. You're also a successful politician, it would seem, if I just to look at your 
uh, your profile and, and how I've introduced you. And you definitely, I mean, you definitely know the challenges firsthand. This is something that you would have experienced. Um, would you say that when countries come together it, under ECONEC, um, under ECOWAS, are they very frank with themselves or do they find themselves on the defensive in terms of trying to say, well, we're doing better than you. This is where we are. Um, but is, is in terms of, you know, trying to brag about situations that ordinarily could get better. Are, um, they, are they honest enough? I think, I think what happens initially at such meetings is this first the diplomacy of, you know, trying to feel your way around things. But I think ultimately yesterday we did end up having the frank conversation about the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the fact that the monetization of politics, unless we can deal with it, is going to be an impediment to actually the gender mainstreaming that we're hoping to achieve and having more persons with disability having a fair chance and the youth having a fair chance. And then the normalization of corruption. You know, we don't like to talk about it, but it's the reality. Until we accept the fact that it is not the norm. It happens, but when it gets to the point where corruption becomes so huge that it gets in the way of fair elections, when it gets in the way of development, we need to look closely at how we're doing things because it undermines the very structures of democracy that we're hoping to promote. Mm. You know, but yes, I think we, we did have uh, very frank conversations yesterday. We had um, a lot of um, members from Guinea-Bissau, from Guinea, we had from Sierra Leone, we had from Ghana, from Nigeria, of course, you know, from many countries. And the conversation was frank and that was refreshing because one would expect that it would be, but we needed to have that frank conversation on why we're not getting where we need to get to. You know, so. I'm smiling because right now uh, we're in front of national TV <laughs> and here I am uh, with a lovely Ghanaian lady. <laughs> um, and the f even though you want to talk about some of the things, you're a little torn between patriotism uh, and talking about the real issues about, uh, as to how it is here in Nigeria. You talked about 16% of women in Ghanaian parliament. 13%. 13 13 it is far better than what is <laughs> happening in Nigeria. I think we're at an all-time low. We've not had it this bad with, with women representation yes. in parliament. It's really, really, uh, you know, it's a terrible situation. We're hoping that it will get better. I think it's about 6 or 7%. Yes, um, which and is sad. It is very sad, especially when you look at the fact that we're hoping that things will get better. But let us see how you know, things... I was hoping that we, we could get an example of at least a West African model uh, that people would say this country seems to be making uh, some appreciable progress. I know that oftentimes when you do development studies, um, Cape Verde is usually cited as a pretty good example. Now, when you talk about the cost of elections, and this report is out, even though you say that you've not had the time and a lot of people because it just came out yes. from what we can read here in fact the the i think the the portuguese version is yet to be translated that's correct so um would you say though i don't know if you've seen the executive summary um whether there was anything remarkable or perhaps even from the testimonies that you have heard from different countries maybe Cape Verde, maybe another country which we're not looking at uh, as to examples or improvements that other African countries can follow? I think if we look at the continent, the, the countries that have managed to actually increase the number of women in parliament have had to go down the route of affirmative action. And countries which actually took the affirmative action, ended up with the number of women going up, took it off the table, and then the women went down again, and they had to put it back on, Egypt for example, um, it means that we still have a certain level of conditioning in our society. So we can't expect to ad address the issue of women representation in parliament if we are not looking at our societal conditioning. Mm. So affirmative action at what level? At uh, every level. Okay. At okay. every level. It's a good but thing you say start, that. Because yeah. you, you can't just look at women representation in parliament. What about at the local level? What about um, on boards? What about everywhere else? I mean... Um, not too long ago, the, the UN came up with this research that proved that when you have more women on a peace, peace building committee, you have longer lasting peace. In Ghana, in the Ashanti Kingdom, we do, we've always known this. The Queen Mother is the one who selects the Queen, uh, the King. The Queen Mother is the one who's in charge of mediation. So we, we instinctively, we've always known this somehow. And I don't think it's too far-fetched for us to actually 
go back and look at what is good in our history, what's good in our culture, and bring it back. You know, and um, there's, no, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We have examples all over. Uganda, you know, has uh, a quota system where they have seats for women, they have seats for youth, they have seats for persons with disability. Until we have a society that is willing to embrace the, that inclusivity sense of, of, of acceptance within the governance structure, we're going to have to find ways of making it happen. Mm. And the, the affirmative action, which, strictly speaking, usually is meant to have the biggest impact on parliament, but it really needs to have a trickle-down effect so that you have that kind of representation of the various strata in society. And so while this isn't you're just doing women it, for women alone in just government. It, it has to be felt in terms of the lives of women exactly. at the level of um, governance. Exactly. You know, for example, things that we, we probably don't think about, but women as women, I'm a mother. And one of the things that I find very striking is the fact that in, in a lot of places where women have to work, there are no provisions made for child care. As a mother, you don't want to have to sacrifice on looking after your children for your work or have to give up the op opportunity of a promotion because you want to look after your children. And being able to have a level playing field that says that you're a working mother and you have an option to have safe child care facilities at work kind of helps to even out the playing field. It's very simple, but it changes the work environment for a woman and makes it possible for her to strive to rise beyond a certain level at work. Mm. Because otherwise, automatically, you kind of get cut off. Oftentimes, you know? I also find, I mean, pardon me, I don't want to make assumptions of how old you are or how old your children are, but oftentimes you find out that when women decide that eventually they want to go into politics, especially parliament, they usually of a certain age. Uh, they're not people who have young children. Very rarely do you find women with young children, you know, even aspiring along the lines of politics. Um, do you think that there needs to be some encouragement in that regard as well, so that while we're looking at women, we're not trying to also edge out young women uh, who could do, you know, great, great things because of the fact that they have families to look after? Which is exactly the point about creating the structures in place that yeah. support women so that they can strive. So to perhaps do the example things. will start from Parliament. Yes. Actually, in, in Ghana, for example, yeah. um, I, I actually made a comment on the floor regards to child care facilities for women members of parliament, and the speaker is pursuing that very seriously. He actually um, commissioned a couple of MPs, myself and another colleague of mine who's also a medical doctor, to actually find facilities on the premises of parliament to make sure that staff and members of parliament have access to child care facilities. And it starts that way. But the other thing as well is violence against women in politics. And it does not have to be physical violence, psychological, emotional, or this new trend on um, social media where women are attacked or, you know, denigrated on all sorts of things, on anything but their competence. That in itself is enough to make a woman decide she probably doesn't want to go into it. Because if you have children, your children are probably going to be exposed to the abuse that mm -hmm. you're, you're having to put up with. And um, most people have spent a lifetime building a reputation for themselves. I'm going to ask you to hold your thoughts for us. And we'll finish this conversation when we come back from this break. Please stay with us. To have with us this morning um, a representative from Econec. They're having their General Assembly here in uh, Nigeria. And uh, yeah, she's Dr. Zanetto. Ajaman Rollins, Honorable Member of Parliament at the Kotli Kole constituency in the Republic of Ghana. And with our closing moments with her right here in the studio, we're talking about, um, you know, this body, this national electoral network of electoral commissions in the West African region. And I just want to know, do you have an idea of how much it is that this body could be saving electoral commissions across the West African region? I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. I think that would, be, that would be unfair to do so. But I think once you have access to all the documentation, you know, the reports and everything, that will definitely guide you as to how much. But I think if we can harmonize the electoral process across the sub-region, it would make a difference. I mean, the reality is 
echo us as it is, the structures we have in place, whether it's for peace and security, you know, the architecture we have for our security, uh, whether it's for electional process, electoral processes, we, we have a pretty nice, nice system. You know, we just need to harmonize it across the sub-region and, um, and see how we can consolidate democracy. Because um, with some of the issues we're having in the Sahel, which are now infringing on the northern part of Nigeria, on um, many countries as well, Burkina Faso, and, you know, slowly coming further towards the, the, the coast of the western, the western, west, western sub-region. We... Are you talking about security challenges? Yes. Okay. You see, you can't divorce peace and security from the electoral process, from democracy. You know, if you have a failed state, democracy means nothing. If people don't have their rights, then voting means nothing. And if voting just means that you're maintaining the status quo and nothing changes, then it means nothing. So beyond the cost of elections, it's also about making sure that people's rights are upheld, you know, and, and that people have the right to live a dignified existence, that people are not having to live in fear or not come out of their homes because of the, 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 the ethnic group they belong to or whichever uh, religion they belong to or whether they're women or whether they're below a certain age. You know, all of these things are part of what good, good governance is about. So the, the role of ECONEC in protecting the sanctity of our elections is not just in isolation. It also extends the peace and security architecture within the sub-region, all of which are intertwined, and you can't have one without the other. So the cost, as important as it is, almost becomes slightly secondary to ensuring that the process is as good as it should be across the, the sub-region. But oftentimes, it's usually outside the purview of the electoral bodies. I mean, right now, the electoral bodies are coming together to see how it is that they can you know, reduce the cost and, and do some peer review mechanism amongst themselves. That's right. The environment in which they conduct these elections is extremely important to them. How is it that they can influence uh, the environment in which they conduct elections, especially when they have really no powers to, 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 to any power and security, so to speak? That's the tricky thing when it comes to this, because um, there is, it's one thing talking about the the ECOWAS sub-region, and then it's another thing talking about the sovereignty of the nation states. Mm -hmm. And it's that fine balance between how do we ensure that we're all adhering to those, those rules and regulations that we've set for ourselves. I think it ultimately comes down to two things um, which are really connected. Leadership, the political will of leadership in the various nation states, but then also the ability of the citizens to mobilize themselves and ensure that their will as a people is being adhered to with regards to what their wishes are in their various countries. Well, it's a fine place to live it. We have to thank you very much for gracing us with your presence this morning. Thank you. Susanna Ita Ijerman Rollins is the Honorable Member of Parliament at the Kotli Kotli Constituency in the Republic of Ghana. Well, that's where we leave it for Sunrise Daily this morning. Uh, yes, the program continues tomorrow. I have to thank you so much for watching. I'm Malpa Yusuf. Well, I'm Kairi Okikiolu. And I'm Ayo Makide. You have a wonderful day. The views and opinions expressed by guests on this program are those of the maker and do not reflect the views, opinions and endorsement of Channels Television.